Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the Podium Series DD2 wheelbase solution from the guys at Fanatec. We finally have one in to put through the SRG review process, along with the all new Fanalab tuning software. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. So now for our closer look segment on the Podium DD2. I'm not going to talk too much about the dimensions here. Maybe the weight. It is a heavy motor. It's like 21 pounds, 12, 12 and a half ounces. Or for the rest of the world, that would be 9.880 kilos, as you can see in those pictures. And yeah, it's a substantial wheel when you pick it up. It's heavy. So you're going to want a, a solid mount for this thing. You don't want to throw it on a play seat, a play seat challenge, rather, and think you're going to get some fidelity out of this thing. Yeah, it's, it's going to be shaking and moving around so much, uh, you're not going to know what's going on. Right, so the prominent thing that we see is the, the front shaft assembly here in our quick release assembly, and also the OLED. I'm going to show you guys a picture of that. It, yeah, here's the default screen on it. And actually, what you do, this has the uh, F1 version 2 wheel on it, and you just hit the tuning menu button, hold that down, use the funky switch to navigate through the screens, and it has the, obviously the default force feedback torque, motor data, temperature, and sysinfo. And of course, that's live real-time information, which is kind of nice, actually. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but yeah, it's nice to have some information to look at. And other guys were driving this wheel. I was actually checking that out and seeing what kind of torque they were doing. The torque was the main thing. I was interested in, obviously, everybody else is too. See what kind of torque they were getting at certain points of the track when they're driving the car. Very cool to have that information available. I wish all wheels, direct drive wheels, had that kind of functionality. But yeah, it is what it is. Now, the mounting piece on this case, it's, you know, I'm not sure why they went this direction, and I'm sure a lot of people were scratching their heads at the same time with this side mount set up with two M8 bolts, right? So we got two on both sides, and of course, Fnatic has their cool system where they're mounting it to their cockpit, and actually some people have come out with some solutions already for that. So not that big of a deal to do that, but it would have been nice to see some kind of a front mount because there's a lot of front mounts that are very, very solid that we could have mounted this to, but I digress. Right, we also have the usual suspects on the bottom here, and that's the three, the triangle pattern that we have in a lot of wheel decks that we attach wheel bases to, but we also have an additional two holes here. So you can actually drill a couple more holes and run two more six M6 bolts in here, and that will give us five total on the bottom. Hey, the more the merrier when it comes to these high torque motors, if you ask me. So yeah, I think that's a good idea to do that if you can. Well, looking on the back here, this is where all the plug-ins go, and we have lots of ventilation back here, as you can see. Lots of vents. And you can see there's a fan on the top. You can see the blades through there. And that actually runs pretty quietly. I've never even heard it. And I know it was running because I was going through those screens and I would check to see what the temperature was and it would, it would actually show you the RPM of the fan. So again, very cool information. And of course, we have the cooling air that is blowing out. It's actually blowing air out and taking it in the front. So we also have all the connections in the back. Now I'll show you guys there. We have a data connection. We have the e-stop and of course the all important torque key and a K-A-N or rather C-A-N, K-A-N. CAN, which is a CAN interface for data. Again, other data. And we have shifter one, two, pedals and handbrake, the usual suspects. A USB-B interface and the power button. And of course, where we plug in our power supply, the six pin Molex sticking out of the back there. Right. So what else we wanna see? Let's talk about this quick release. This quick release system, and I'm sure you guys, if, you, if you're interested in, in the Fanatic stuff, have already seen this. This has this rubber piece here that is replaceable, I understand, because we can pull this whole assembly off. And yeah, it actually will move back and forth a little bit, which is good because we need to compress it. And I'm gonna get a close-up shot of it here for you guys. There we go. Now how this works is we have this big ring here, obviously, with the finger grips on it, so we can tighten this up. And you do need to tighten it up. <laughs> and we have this floater ring here, it's kind of floating back and forth. And you can actually see the threads right here. And on the front of that, you see it's a smooth bore there. And we actually have, you can see these little pieces there. Those are tracks that this rides in on both sides of the shaft. So that guides it and keeps the locating key notch. I, I call it a key notch because it's kind of like one. 
and keeps everything in line obviously and that's what we wanted to do we have the indentations milled into the front here obviously for the ball bearings to receive the ball bearings in our quick release what else do we want to see here that's about it we got this big clamp on the back and by the way and i'll probably say this again sometime when you get your wheel if you get a dd1 or d2 make sure you check that and make sure it's tight because when i got mine it didn't it would lose center and i was trying to figure out what the heck was going on and i went on the internet looked around and found out yeah the reason it does that is some of these come from the factory aren't quite torqued down tight enough and they do slip a little bit so yeah if you're losing center then all you got to do is tighten these m6 bolts down there's two of them and of course they clamp down on this metal shaft here that has you can see the gap right there it's on both sides and that clamps down and squeezes on top of this assembly so all this gold piece here is all one assembly that goes back inside of there where there's actually some plugs inside of that hollow shaft obviously because we have the electronics plugging in in the front there the wireless solution if you will <laughs> and we also have the hole right here for the m6 bolt if you want to use that i did use that and it really didn't have much effect speaking of which i'm going to show you guys some quick b-roll here this is the f1 v2 wheel and you can see that even with this even with the ring the the finger ring tight as tight as i can get it it still has play in it and that's just you know that's always been there with the fanatic quick release it's just one of the characteristics of it it's always been there and i actually i have a universal hub too and you can see the same thing there and actually in the universal hub i used the six millimeter bolt and still no joy it's still moving around which i kind of expected but again that's just inherent in the fanatic system it's always been there in every wheel i've had from fanatic with their quick release system just a little bit of flex in there and it's a shame that they, i understand why they went with this you got to have backwards compatibility you know, you, you can't be selling ten th tens of thousands of wheels over the years and then come out with a new system and go, oh, by the way, you can't use those wheels. So you've got to keep the system. But the, the problem with that is now we're dealing with some heavy-duty torque here, 25 Newton meters this thing's capable of. And it'd be nice to have something clamped on like the rest of the DD solutions out there. But I under completely understand why Fanatic has done this. My only question is why or will they come up with a system that let's say has a clamp like this or similar to this but has a on the front of it has machined into it a 70 millimeter star pattern so you can mount a 70 millimeter quick release of your own choosing to it and then use your own wheels that way and use usb plugged into your computer and that will give us a solid mount to this wheel because we don't have the completely solid mount we are going to be losing as you might imagine some of the finer finer little details that the force feedback is coming out of this motor in other words the capabilities of this motor aren't going to be fully realized until you can have a solid mount it to the wheel and that just makes sense hopefully they'll do that or somebody will come out with something i'm sure it'll have to have a chip in it just like the universal hub does to tell the the wheel firmware back here that hey you know this is a wheel that you can use just go ahead and no operate normally if you will so again tightening this thing up is squeezing the rubber piece here and yeah it's bulges it out and that's supposed to take the slack out of the quick release they knew well of course they knew <laughs> that the, the quick release system was going to have some play in it and they were trying to and this is the, the solution they came up with to get rid of it but unfortunately it doesn't work again the shaft itself is solid as a rock you can see when i did that video that this does not move it's solid as a rock it's great but again, it's the quick release that's going to give you that uh, some flex in there that is, again, any flex is going to dampen, if you will, the finer details coming from the wheel. So the full potential of the motor is not quite realized. I don't know how much you're losing. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, if, you, if you would really notice, I think I would because of the different motors I've used and still continue to use in the, in the solid mounts for those. I would probably notice the difference if we could put a solid mount on here because yeah you can you could see in that video how much these hubs actually do move around right so other than that yeah not much else to look at on the motor side oh one more thing let me show you this these carbon fiber plates i believe the dd1 has just plain plastic ones but they actually come off they have magnets on them <laughs> and on the top here you have your serial number for your motor and some other stuff the usual fanatic podium tells you what this is as far as the model uh, the capabilities 36 volts you know that kind of thing it's got the the certifications for EMI interference, things like that. Right, and all three sides do come off. 
And I imagine that on the DD1, it doesn't have the carbon fiber, so they, they have the regular plastic ones there. So I was thinking later, somebody, maybe even Fanatic, will come up with different colors or something. You could take this carbon off and put a gold one or silver or red or blue or something on it. That would be pretty cool. Or maybe somebody in the aftermarket will come up with something like that. Right. Just thinking here, as we always do. All right, let's take a quick look at just a couple other main pieces that we get here. This is the emergency stop. And it's a plastic piece, right? Plastic housing. And there's a, the back look of it there, with this serial number on it. And we also can see the cable routing there. We've got two ways to go. We can go out to this side, or we can actually go out the bottom, or in this case, I believe it is, yeah, that's the side, because if you look at the label, if you want the label to look correct, it goes out the side. And the long one's actually coming out the top, which I believe I used the side one. I can't remember. But I, I'll, I'll show you guys that once we get there, as far as the emergency stop and how it was working. Right, so this is actually a power button on the bottom here. Is that a power button? And the emergency stop functions as a power button, not a torque disable mechanism. So when you pop this down, it actually powers down the whole motor. Whole motor shuts down. And then you have to turn it clockwise to release it and then power it back up, right? So that's, that's just the deal. You have to power it back up. And I'm assuming that's the same circuit in here that's kind of a serialized circuit that both of the, these buttons are on to do the power. Right, got some six mil fixings on there, little inserts on the metal pieces inside. One, one, two, we've got it on three sides. One, two, three sides, okay? So you should be able to get a, a way to mount it. And I was able to mount this on my rig, no problem. But we'll talk about that later when we have it mounted and we'll talk about some of the other things. But yeah, easy to get everything plugged in on the back here and yeah, no, nothing to it. It's, it's very simple stuff. And of course, the important piece here is our torque key. There's that guy right there. That's very important. It has a chip in there in the plastic piece that tells the motor that you have the key in there and it will enable full torque, full torque rather, capabilities of the motor. Very cool. You want to make sure you plug that in. Because <laughs> people have actually, I've read on the forums where the guys have actually got, I'm not getting full torque. Something's wrong. And yeah, they didn't put the torque key in. So and it's easy enough mistake to make if you haven't read the directions, <laughs> which, you know, a lot of us don't do it right off the bat until we have a problem. Let's take a look at the power supply. This is a big power supply. It's very long. It's actually, get the motor back out here. It's actually longer than the motor a little bit, the, the housing on the motor. So it's a biggie. And let's see what we got here. Fanatic switching power supply. We can see that there. And we have a capability on this thing. My pointer is always getting away from me. We have a capability you can see right here. Uh, I'm always looking for the output, not the input. 36 volts at 13.33 amps max. So that's a lot of power. And it's actually a different kind of power supply because you see these little ports here? They're actually air intakes. And on the back, I don't know how well you're going to see this in this light. It's really hard to see that baby. But there's actually a fan in there. It looks like a 50 millimeter computer fan. I hope that's showing up a little bit. But uh, yeah, there's a fan in there. And I never heard that run, even though it was behind my monitors sitting on my cart. Uh, I never heard any noise coming from this. So yeah, I guess I, I was never pushing it hard enough. <laughs> Although my shoulders and wrists think I was pushing it hard enough. So yeah, power supply. The normal suspects here. We do have this six pin Molex. On the, back, on the front, all right, so that we actually connect to the motor. You saw that before on the motor part. So yeah, easy enough here. And that's just the basic stuff. Obviously, we have a cable for this. And, you know, no sense in showing you that. We, it comes with a USB cable. It comes with the usual stuff to get you up and running. So yeah, I think that's about it for the closer look. And what we'll do next is actually, I'm going to take this off first and take a look at that and see how that assembly works and maybe talk a little bit about what we might be able to do or a third party might be able to do to get a better clamp on here, or not a better, but another clamp on this motor shaft that will allow us to mount our own quick releases. That would be very cool and a very solid no-flex solution too. So we'll get to that next. Now for our look inside on the wheel shaft quick release assembly. At least that's what I'm calling it. And yeah, but it's nice that Fanatic actually let us or gave us a way to maintain or do maintenance on this quick release system. It's obviously this rubber piece here is going to, well, it's going to wear because it's rubber. So it's going to have to be replaced. And you can see you can actually move this back and forth when you have everything really loose here. 
you can move this rubber piece back and forth. So once we have this off, we should be able to slip it off the back. So let's go ahead and take it off. Right, so what we're going to need is, these are five millimeter socket head cap screws. You've got one there, they're M6s, and we've got one over here. And it's a clamp system. You can see we have a little seam right there, and we have one on the other side. Where'd it go? There it is. And it clamps down on the motor shaft that is actually attached to the motor. Let's get this out of the way. Maybe we can see that too. There's a little seam in here, or a crack space, if you will, right in there on both sides. You can see on that side, and, and we have one on this side. And when you put this back on, make sure that these slots here are lined up together as best you can get them. Obviously, this is just clamping down on that and squeezing down on this part that goes inside. So, without further ado, let's get this loose. And it should be pretty tight, so always use a regular type of Allen wrench. This is a 5 mil ball L-shaped one, so you can get some leverage on it. So we'll go ahead and start loosening this. Now, typically we'll loosen this on one bolt, maybe, there we go, turn it half a turn or so, and then go to the other one and do the same thing. Because you, when you tighten it, you want to do it the same way. You want to alternate as you tight, or tighten rather, and yeah, that keeps the clamp even. So I can loosen that one. Oh, it's already ready to come out. So we've got it loose enough to come out, but probably not loose enough to come off the shaft, and I want to be able to take this off. So there we go. Now it's loose. You can see it's moving around. You can see this is moving around. Now, be mindful here. We're going to be encountering a couple of plugs, electrical plugs here, as you might imagine because of the connection here for our wheels. All right, so we gently slide this out. Make sure you guys get a good angle of it there. There we go. And it's a smooth shaft you can see here as it's coming out. So let's go ahead. And I can feel some spring back, you see that? There's actually some spring back tension. And that's probably the wires in here. So again, this is something you wanna be mindful of, especially if your wheel has turned around a lot. It may have twisted the wires a little bit in there. There we go, it just popped out. And there we go, there's the plugs coming out. There they are. So we have kind of a staggered plug situation here and that's so they will fit into the hole, obviously. If they were next to each other, bunched up, they probably weren't, aren't gonna go in the hole. So we kind of gently pull this out. And what I will probably do here is as I'm doing this is I'm gonna take one plug off first and you can see we have one plug with some black wires on it, this one here closest to you. And then we have the other plug that has the orangish wires on it. And that's the first plug. So I'm going to go ahead and take that off. There is, looks like a two clamp system here. You have to kind of grab the plug with two fingers on the sides and then push down on this tab on the top and it should separate. So let's see how that, there we go. That was easy enough. So it's separate now. So we've uh, detached it and you can see there's some pin holes in there. Six of them it looks like. So now we've got to disconnect the other one. And this one's, I'm trying to, I'm going to kind of bend down and look in there. Yeah, it looks pretty free there. So I'm going to see if I can just jiggle it to get it out far enough to get my fingers on it. But remember, you don't want to have to pull it out a lot and put a lot of tension on it and then disconnect it because then it's going to pop back in. If it's twisted in there, you can actually untwist these wires a little bit to give you more room like this. You have to look down in the shaft though and see what's going on. So as you can see, as I'm, I'm actually looking down here, I can see, yeah, that the, if I twist it this way, it gives me a little more slack. And now the, the plug is kind of hanging out here, so I'm confident I'll be able to get it reattached. You know, taking apart things is easy, usually, but yeah, putting them back together can be problematic. All right, so that plug is off too. In another, I'll give you a close-up look at this. Let me get a focus there. There we go. And you can see we have these Molex plugs, six pin. And we have the smooth shaft here that actually slides inside the motor shaft, the hollow motor shaft, and clamp, and that's the clamping surface that holds it. And it works very well, by the way. There, again, no flex at all in this, this part of the system on this wheel. And now we can actually take this back piece here, the actual torque screw, I'm calling it, torque, uh, torque nut, and unscrew it. So as I'm unscrewing it, it's just going to come off the back, I'm assuming. <laughs> Might want to tilt it up a little bit so it doesn't fall off. All right. 
All right, so now we have it loose, we can just pull it right off. And this is what this looks like. The raised area here, and this is where I was talking about putting some lubrication on here, because that's what presses against the, the washer that's pressing against the rubber. It just makes it a little easier to tighten it up. And I use, again, that silicone, that 100% silicone lube. Right. You know what I like to see is if they could make a wrench, some kind of a plastic or nylon wrench that would fit on this, get behind it, and then kind of slide over it so you could get it tighter than you can with your hands. Because really, I just I feel like I'm not getting it tight enough sometimes when I'm tightening this down on the rubber piece, or once I have the wheel attached. Anyway, so we'll put that aside. And now we have the washer here. I'm calling it a washer, ring, whatever you want to call it. And you can see, you look closer here, the slots here in between the threads on both sides. And that washer is riding, and you can see it has a tab there, and it has a tab, oops, going the wrong way, on the other side, right? So that guides it and keeps it in the right position so that the key part up here stays in line with the rubber part and, of course, the, the aluminum part out here. So it keeps it lined up like it should be. And this, obviously, this is, again, you can put some grease on this side of it as it presses against the rubber so that, again, tightening it, it helps it tighten a lot better. If I can stay in focus here. All right, so, of course, this slips right off, too. And there's a closer look at that. Just a nice gold anodization on these pieces. Right. Put that aside. And now we just have the rubber left to slide off if we were going to replace it. And I'm not sure how long these are going to last. But anyway, it's, it's just like everything else that we've done so far. It just kind of slides off the back here. Yeah, there we go. Take that off. And the rubber actually has some tabs in it too that will follow the same grooves that the washer follows. And it has the hole in it to facilitate the six mil locking bolt that you can use on the quick release system to give it a little bit more flex reduction, if you will. <laughs> right, so yeah, just a piece of rubber here. This is going to wear out and of course the Fanatic engineers are clever enough to know that and they give us a way to replace it. Very cool. I like how easy this is. I think that most people can do this without too much trouble, the way they have this system set up. And yeah, it's, and plus you've, you've seen how I do it here, so it's pretty easy. So putting it back together, let's say I have a new one of these, simply just take my shaft again and put it back on. And I make sure that the tabs obviously are lining up with the tabs on this metal threaded part here. And we'll go up there on that smooth part. Just press that in, and there you go. Should be. Let's make sure I get. Now there is. Let me show you this before I do. Before I get this all the way on here, there is a little raised piece here, and that's the threaded insert for your M6 bolt that will allow you again to attach it more firmly your wheel to this section up here. So yeah, you want to. There is a little notch cut in there for that. Let me show you that again. That's what that. You see that little notch space up here? Don't give me a focus. There we go. So there is a little notch for that to clear it. And you want to make sure you get it on in the right direction. See how it's closer to one side than the other? You want the close side to be going on first. So that it you can see how close that insert is to this piece here. Right. Put it on. And there it goes. Just like that. How easy can it get? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, now we're going to put this back on, and again, we have the little tabs that are going to follow the tabs in our threaded piece, and we want to make sure the key is on top, matching, I almost put it on backwards, <laughs> upside down, and yeah, just a matter of sliding that back on, good to go, and then of course, our ring will go back on, our lock nut, if you will, our tension nut, whatever you want to call it. And then it's just a matter of plugging this back in, which I'm not going to do right this second, and kind of working the plugs. I'll show you that in a minute here, but I just want to talk about something else here before I, I get to that point. And that is, you see we have a hollow tube here. Actually, I'm going to pull this off. This is the locking ring. All right, so this is actually putting tension. You might even call it a, a, 
a collar, a crush collar. So that's putting tension as we tighten those bolts. We got, remember we have an M6 there and we have another M6 over here on the other side. So as we're tightening those down, and remember you want to kind of rotate tightening it, tightening these down because you want to get it as level as you can as you bring it down. So you don't want it like one side doing this and one side being up. So you want to get it level. Flat on each side as you can. And they're not going to touch each other no matter how tight you get it because yeah, you don't want them to touch each other anyway because if they bottom out before they get this piece tight enough over here or this tight enough on the shaft, then yeah, you got a problem. <laughs> so you will see some gap in this ring. I guess that's what I'm trying to tell you guys is if you see some gap in this ring here, then that's not an issue. Okay, that's that's a good thing. But you want to get it nice and tight. Right. So here's the hollow tube with our little, you can see one of the plugs is actually, see how it's sitting now? It's kind of retracted a little bit. And that does not surprise me because of the way this is twisted up. But you can actually kind of untwist these and get some more room on them. And as I pull the orange one out, the black one kind of peeks out and I can grab that well enough, as you can see here, to get it reattached. So not a big deal. But you want to, when you start shoving everything back in, you want to be very careful how you do that. And we'll, we'll see that in a second. But I just wanted to show you guys an idea here. Now, I, I mentioned in the closer look about being able to mount a wheel directly to this motor shaft to get rid of all the flex. In other words, minimize any flex that you're getting out of the motor or rather on the, the quick release system that's on the wheels of the Fanatic wheel system, right? We saw that the flex in the closer look there. So to get rid of that, and actually, I think this would be a great idea because it would, would probably attract even more people to the Fanatic DD2 wheel. And that is this. Well, this, I'm using this as a model, okay? This is, this is not what I'm talking about. This is not something that will work. And you can see this is, has a flange on it, right? It's a 70 millimeter flange. And this is actually for the HRS quick release system. But you can see this piece coming off here. Now, this is a triangle shape. And yeah, you, you don't want, obviously, we don't want a triangle shape if we were going to be making a piece that would go on here, right? So what would, what my idea is this, because and it's very similar to what we have here. All right, let me take this ring back off and get this off and we'll take a better look at it. So similar, you could make this piece right here, very similar or identical rather to this piece here, just a nice smooth piece on the shaft here, right? And still being hollow, obviously. So if we had this piece on here and it was hollowed out, then we could have, I'm sure there has to be a chip or something that, that Fanatic could embed in here with a, a wires coming out, obviously, and a plug, just like the plugs coming out of this one. And that would allow us to plug it in and then slide it in, just like we slide this in, which we'll see in a minute. And then tighten our ring down on it, clamp it down, and then we've got a 70 millimeter pattern to mount a wheel base side quick release to out of on a quick release system. Then we can mount our, our other wheels. Now you won't be able to mount the fanatic wheels, but if you have other wheels, which you know a lot of guys out there do, then yeah, you could use this system. And not only that, but once we clamp this down, as we saw, this is a very solid design here. Once we clamp this down, this does not move. It's very, very, very solid. Same thing would happen here. Now we have a quick release face that we can mount our other side to our, our wheels to that would have no flex in that connection, like the HRS you see here, the Q1R, something like that. And then that would eliminate the flex of the quick releases that are on the actual Fanatic wheels. So again, I think they could attract more people to the DD system, their podium system, with this feature if they design that. And again, obviously Fanatic would have no problem designing something like that. It would slide right in here, we clamp it down, and you're done. Of course, you have to plug it in because you'd have to have some kind of chip in here to tell this motor or the wheel-based system that, yeah, you can go ahead and operate normally, kind of like the Universal Hub does. It has a chip in it that tells the motor, go ahead and operate normally, even though it's not a Fanatic wheel attached to it. It's kind of faking out the wheelbase, and the wheelbase thinks a Fanatic wheel is attached to it, basically. Right. So, yeah, that, just, just I throw that out there because... You know, even a third party, if they could get the chip from Fnatic, could actually develop this. And this would be, I mean, they could market this as like a, a, a high performance upgrade for your podium system or something. I don't know. But yeah, I would love to see that. Because now, I mean, not now, but then 
we would be getting every bit of fidelity out of this motor possible. And we probably were actually losing a little bit with the normal Fanatic quick release system. But yeah, something like a solution like this would get the max out of this out of this motor. Not that it you're not getting enough out of it already. And the flex in the wheels on the quick release system for Fanatics are not that problematic. It's just something here at the SRG, as you know, we are we're totally in the uh, anti-flex camp, <laughs> if you will. We try to minimize flex at every every opportunity that we can. And that just increases, again, the possible fidelity that you can feel from any motor, for that matter, not just, obviously, these DD, these Podium Series motors. And, yeah, so, yeah, Fanatic, if you're listening, something to consider, right? Or if there's a third-party party person out there who wants to license a Fanatic chip, maybe that would work. I don't know. But, yeah, I just thought I'd throw it in there. And, yeah, as I usually do, I'm thinking when I'm looking at these things and taking things apart of how, how we might be able to improve things a little bit. Okay, so that's it. Now, to put this back on, it's a simple matter of attaching this part back on. And I'll go back to my close-up for this. Okay. And we're, obviously, we're not tightening it up yet. Then we're going to want to make sure this assembly has been put back together all the way. And as I said before, I'm going to... Well, I have this off. It's a little easier to do it this way. I had some on there before, but I wiped it all off for the, for the video for you guys. And again, this is that... 100% silicone lube I'm putting on it so it won't damage the rubber at all. And I also put it on the rubber, the rubber piece here for making it a little easier to get the wheel on. So just put a light little bead on there like that. Don't need anything real heavy. Kind of make it, try to make it a little neat <laughs> if that's even possible. All right. So, yeah. That's, that's, I'm going to put that down. You're going to see it anymore. Now let me, i got to wipe the grease off of my hands. Right, so we'll put this back on, just like we took it off, just like we said before. And slide that on, it actually goes on pretty quick, and especially after you've done it a couple times. And then we'll put our tensioning nut back on here. There we go. And I'm just gonna run it up so I have plenty of room back here to get back into the shaft. Now this is the only really, I don't, I don't know if I wanna call it tricky, the, where you have to pay attention, let me put it that way, when you put this back on, I'm trying to get some of this grease off. Okay. You know what? Before I plug this back in, I meant to show you guys something about this motor and the collar. So let me turn this around. First off, this collar has these holes in it we saw before, right? And those are breather holes. Because on the back here, not in the back, but actually on the front of the motor, there's a foam filter here. This is the air intake for the cooling system for the motor. Fans on the rear, and it pulls the air through here. And this is just a filter system here for it. So when we put this on here, now there are holes in there to facilitate that flow. You could theoretically put this up against, let me show you the side view here, all the way up to the housing, and it could still get some air through those holes. All right? But... The, the mechanic in me says, yeah, it's probably better to go ahead and pull this out a bit to leave some space by, behind there so that, yeah, it's got to be more airflow that way than it is with this. But because the Fanatic's going to allow people to do maintenance on this rubber piece here and take things off, that's why those holes are there, I'm sure, in case somebody puts it on all the way flush like that. You can still get some cooling holes. And I guess that would be enough, just, just those holes there, right on the top and the bottom. But yeah, the, <laughs> the, the guy who's done a lot of work on cars and motors and things all, for most of my life tells me, yeah, why not pull it out a little bit? You know, it doesn't hurt anything to do that, I'm sure, because we still have the full clamping force, the full clamping piece here that's actually interfacing with the actual motor shaft. So the full surface area is still contacting it. And yeah, so yeah, that's the way I would do it. Again, you can do it any way you want to. It's up to you guys. But yeah, I think I'm going to leave it out a little bit because of that airflow. Just want to point that out before I plug this in and get everything tightened back up. Right, so let's do that. Now, the plugs, obviously, I can see the orange one hanging out and the black one has snaked back in there, which is not uncommon. And I can kind of jiggle the orange one to get it to come back out a little and just enough to get my fingers on it and bring it back out. Now, if you can't get your fingers on it and get it to come out, which actually it's kind of, 
giving me a little bit of trouble here. Oh, there it is. You can use obviously a, you know something like a pair of tweezers or you know needle nosed pliers, a small a small set to grab it. Just make sure you don't crush anything when you're grabbing it. So yeah. The idea is obviously getting it back out so we can plug it in, and we're going to do that now. So make sure you go black to black. <laughs> you don't want to go orange to black. In fact, I wonder if you can do that. You certainly can. So these plugs are the same, so you could get them mixed up if you're not paying attention. So pay attention. Easy enough, though. I don't, I don't know how you can mess this up unless you're not looking at it at all and don't care or whatever. But yeah, there's black to black, and then we'll get the orange ones plugged in like that. Everything's nice and tight. You hear that click, you know you're good to go. And obviously we're going to keep them staggered as they go back in the shaft. Now remember, some of this is going to go back inside of this part too. So the way I do this, and of course you can do it any way you want to, but I kind of just kind of shove everything back together. Mindful, I don't want to pinch any wires. I'm looking around as I'm going in to make sure everything looks good. And then what I'll do is kind of shake it back and forth as I'm going in, right, like this. And that helps the plugs, the plastic plugs, work their way back inside the hollow piece of this shaft here. Get a little sideways. And doing that also will keep them from pressing it back on the shaft too much. But you can see, I still have a little bit of spring back. And that's to be expected because everything's very loose. And now I'm going to get my collar out. And again, I want to get these, the sections on this collar. Let me move this motor sideways here so you can see them. Like that. I'm going to be looking at the collar halves and the space in between them and the space in between where the slots are in our motor shaft here just to make sure that they line up properly or as, as evenly as possible is really I guess the best way to go here and go ahead and get this back in and I can put your finger on the bottom you can kind of catch that with your finger here and keep it pressed against the back and now that I look at it looks like everything's pretty much lined up I'm going to snug one side up enough to hold everything together. It shouldn't take that much. I could probably do it with the ball end here and just finger strength. Again, you don't want to have to force anything here. And I'm just snugging that up with my fingers. And that looks like it's enough for me, now for me to be able to turn this. All right. And now nothing's moving. So I can turn it. And now I can start alternating, tightening down these M6 bolts. So I'll go over to this one and actually put a like a quarter turn or so on this, depending how loose it is. Yeah, maybe even a half. And then I'll come back and do a little bit on this one. Quarter. Then I'll do quarters because this one's kind of loose to begin with. So I'll just do quarter turns as I'm t tightening these down. And you don't have to put a lot of torque on this, I don't think. Although it was a little tough getting it off, wasn't it? So how it comes off is usually a gauge of how, you need, how <laughs> tight it needs to be when you get it back going. You can see it slipping around a little bit on my rubber mat here. And that feels pretty good. Of course, the ultimate test is going to be once you get everything hooked back up and you're running it at high torque levels. If you lose your steering wheel center while you're driving, then you know that you need to tighten this clamp up. And I think I said in a closer look that when I got mine out of the box and had the 25 newton meter torque running on it 100% and just testing, I did lose center. And I went on the internet trying to figure out what's going on there. And yeah, you need, just need to tighten this collar up, and then it went away. Everything was good after I did that. So, and one more point that I didn't show you. What I usually do is, before I take something like this off, if I've already got the wheel centered, I'll look down the top here and make a mark pencil or whatever I can figure out how to mark that, or, and just so that it's centered when I put everything back together and I match the keyway here up with that mark, and then everything should be centered when I put it all back together. It's not that big of a deal because it's not a hard process to establish your center wheel in the process that Fanatic has for these wheel systems. In other words, the wheel centering process. So yeah, not a big deal, but it's just something I kind of like to do. And I certainly do on other servo type motors that I use, even though this is an outrunner. So I'm not sure if you would call that a servo or not, but regardless, that's done. And yeah, we should be good to go now. All I have to do now is plug everything back up and remount it and make sure everything works. I usually will take this and while it's still on the bench, put the wheel back on it, plug everything back up, start it up and make sure that all my connections are good, still good and everything still works. You know, the OLED menu pops back up and yeah, and, it's, and it cycles like it usually does, which I'm sure it will. It's just two plugs. 
How can you mess that up, Barry? <laughs> right, so next we'll get to, actually we'll take a look inside of the motor housing itself, and that'll be on the back because there's really not much going on in the front, but we'll talk more about that when we get to that segment. All right, let's go ahead and see if we can get the rear off of this motor case and take a look at what's inside. First off, we have to, as you saw in a closer look, these carbon panels come off. And we're going to have to remove those because of the, you can see that the case here goes into those carbon plates. And we don't want to mess those up if we can get them off, right? So let's see if I can get a fingernail under here and get this off. It can be a little tricky. There we go. So there's one, two, and we'll get the other set off the same way. Oh, there we go. So now we have the connecting seam exposed. Now we have some M8 cap head. Either these are screws or nuts. I'm not sure. We're, we're going to pull them off and take a look and see what these things really are. So, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. All right. That's coming off pretty pretty easy. They're not real tight. That one's a little bit tighter. Okay, we can get this one. And one more. All right, so those are pretty loose now, I think. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can turn them with the ball. Yes, I can. And to speed things up, I'm going to get the old driver out, eh? And I have this cool little bit here that is a M8. A little ball in the front. Makes things easier to do. I get the bottoms out usually first. It's loose. That one's loose. Go to the top. And, huh, that's a nut. Okay, so these came out. Let me show you a close-up of it. It's kind of a, a sleeve nut, if you will. So get those out of the way. The other two did not come off like that. Ah, there we go. I'm pulling this out. And you see here we have a threaded rod. So there's threaded rod obviously where these were too. It's just that they're stuck in the front part where they screw into the front of this case. So yeah, we've got, looks like we're going to have two rods and two nuts. Now, easy enough, we're going to be able to get these nuts back on once we get this back on just by kind of putting them on like that and that's fine, right? So now that it's loose, let's see if we can crack it open very carefully. Let's see here. Well, it doesn't seem to want to, oh, there we go. You know what? I'm going to get my non-marring little pry bar here and gently nudge this thing and see if I can get it to cooperate. Actually, I think I need more gap than that. Might be some kind of a, we have to work it out a little bit. There we go. So, yeah, this slipped down there and then it popped open. All right, so now we're loose. Good. So let me go over here to the our close-up. And let's see if we can, I don't know how far I'm going to be able to get this because obviously there's wires in here and you can see them down in there. In fact, let me turn it towards the light a little better. There we go. And there it is. And you can see our fan in here. We got our nice electrical fan. And that obviously is pulling air around the motor casing in here. Let's see. Looks like a bit much to disconnect everything. So I think I'm going to leave it there as it is. Now I could probably actually get this threaded rod out on both sides if I wanted to go with threaded rods back in. But yeah, I, I almost prefer to have the threaded rod there because now I'm going to have to thread this all the way to the case, to the front of the case and, and find that hole where it goes in. But it shouldn't be too hard. Right, so we actually have this is little plastic housing down here that goes underneath the motor. And that kind of holds the motor, I imagine, from moving around, even though the casings, once it's clamped down, probably tighten up and make that happen. So, yeah, there's not a lot of room to, to work with here. Maybe, tell you what, this one looks, I've got a, let's see if i got something I can get in there and get that off with. Need to pull the, or push that in. 
there we go cool all right so now we can actually see a lot more because i've got one side loose and i'm going to turn the whole thing around this way so we can see more there we go all right all right cool so we've got some i like the way they've got the capacitors as part of the electronics package here nice and tight don't want to put too much pressure i'm always looking for wires that have pressure on them so i'm going to make sure that we don't pressure put too much pressure on a wire and ruin something and ruin my motor right so we have like i said nice little stack of capacitors in here and that's the electronic part on the back and we have actually a couple of extra plugs in here not sure what those are for and yeah just not a whole lot to see we do have a motor number on here that says dd2 and then we have another i guess that's the serial number dd let's see what's on the top here 119 maybe yeah no that's definitely not serial number and just just the manufacturing stuff when it was i don't know that doesn't look like a date either it doesn't look like much i don't know how much you guys could see that let's see if i can get a little closer there we go so anyway nice cable management here as, as i would expect from fanatic you can see the cooling let's see if i can get this tilted up and how here we go you can see the the cooling fins on this motor quite substantial so the airflow for that fans pulling through yeah is keeping this thing pretty cool like i said before in the closer look i never really heard the fan running on this thing and if we turn it this way we can actually turn this around a little bit more so you can see what's in there there we go get a little closer and here's the fan obviously and some other i'm not sure what that's some it looks like we've got some ferrite sinks in there with this heat shrink on it Oop. it's not easy to do keep this thing so you guys can see it there we go so yeah either that or yeah that's what i'm thinking that is so not much to see here just electronics board down there we have two huge braking resistors on here each one of these are 50 watt units 4rj is the number on them so yeah definitely need some big resistors for big power <laughs> so not much else to see here as i, I thought of, I, you know i'm pretty i was pretty sure there wouldn't be i could probably pull the motor out by taking the front cover off and getting everything apart but i really don't see any point in that at this you know because it's all kind of a one just just a motor once you get it out and there's plenty of pictures on the internet of this motor if you look for it but i just want to crack it open just to see what they were doing as far as some of the electronics and what the fan was looking like and you guys know we love to do that and like i said before very thick piece of plastic here that's supporting this part of the motor i can actually move it a little bit if i put some pressure on it but it, obviously the front one's still tight and holding it from the front now again what i what we were talking about here these threaded rods go all the way to the front of the case and there's a, obviously a hole that's threaded that they're going into so that means that i was talking about before maybe drilling some holes in the front of the case and tapping them with m8 threads or something but we can't do that because it's already been done with this <laughs> so we wouldn't be able to get very far we'd, we'd ruin everything right so yeah that's uh the look inside is definitely not lasting very long but yeah it is what it is when it comes to these motors just like uh, when i took apart uh, the back off of the SimuCube 2 pro motor yeah it wasn't much to see there either just the encoder in, a, in the electronic board stack that was on the back so what we'll do next is yeah get everything put back together hopefully everything works when we do this <laughs> and we'll do some driving and i'll do a maybe a quick live tuning session just to show you some of the sliders on the fanalab software that they're they have that control this wheel now but yeah we'll, we'll get to that section next so i used the flat wheel deck for the simlabs p1 rig to mount the wheelbase and it has the holes for those six millimeter bolts or screws again i could actually drill this for those other two holes that are underneath this wheelbase case and put two more six mils if you want to it's pretty tight the way it is and this flat wheel deck is going to have some flex in it anyway it's not stiff like the front mount deck that i use for the p1 here when i'm using other direct drive servo motors which is a shame that we can't again mount the fanatic that way but I do have on order the side mounts that SimLab has now for these P1 or the P1X now rig. And of course, that'll fit the P1 too. And down 
underneath here you can see that's where my emergency stop is mounted and I have an M6 screw let me get a look at it there going into where those threaded inserts are in the case right and we'll just move right around here and you can see I have the cable for it up here just kind of zip tied over here to one of the pieces on the rig and it's going on to the back of the wheel of course because that's where it belongs and we have all our other cables and the torque key attached so now let's get in and drive this thing so here we are in the new application for managing our podium series wheels I'm not sure if this is going to if this is going to be backwards compatible to other wheels that Fnatic or wheel bases that Fnatic puts out but right now we'll just concentrate on the podium first you have the main screen like this and if you look at the top of that main screen well actually it's always there you'll see it says Fanalab version 1.08 beta and yeah this is a beta version and as of this taping which is the 28th of August 2019 this is the latest edition. Now they're going to be coming out obviously with some newer versions and by the time I get this published there might even be a newer version out. So keep that in mind. Right. First off in the main we can see which devices are active is the first thing that you'll see. And yeah, we have the Podium Wheelbase DD2 here. We have the Club Sports Steering Wheel Formula 2. But I don't have any Fanatic pedals connected. So that's why it's not seeing them. No... Uh, you can see there's a launch dashboard, but that's coming soon. That's a feature to be done later. And yeah, I'm not running iRacing at the moment, uh, so it's no game is running, or if I was running a set of courses or any of that stuff. So, and you can actually go over here and highlight on the games here, right? Now, of course, we're gonna be spending most of our time, uh, but well, before I get to the tuning menu, let's just real, go about the settings real quick. And enable balloon messages. If you click on any of these, it'll allow you to disable or enable. And red means disabled, but I want to see the balloon messages because I'm trying to learn how the software works and you'll be wanting to do the same. Auto launch dashboard on game detect, uh, change backgrounds. There's some other things in here. I'm sure some of this is going to change. I can log my settings and I, I can tell it what I want to log right now. Error is the only thing that's affected. Right. Now we also have view telemetry. There's no telemetry right now because there is no game running, but that's just a long list of telemetry items that we can actually look at if we want to. Right, so we'll get rid of that, we'll get rid of the filters. And yeah, we also have an about, but that just tells us that obviously we're in Fanatex Fanalab version 108, August 28th. Hey, see, it said August 28th, 2019. So you know I was correct on, about this version. Right, so let's go ahead and get rid of the control panel and about, get rid of that. And let's go to where we're going to spend most of our time. Tuning menu. Now, here we have device setup, and you can see we are running the Podium Wheel-based DD2. And we have a bunch of things in here. And if you look, it's kind of cool because they've actually put the same letter indicator that represents in the menu that, that we're used to tuning Fnatic with is going into the little display on the wheels in that little window there and going into settings and tuning from there. So we have the same letters representing what we're changing, right? So that's good because it's familiar for people. But really, we're just paying attention to maximum steering angle, overall force back strength, and you can see the bubbles are popping up. Before I get to this device setup, over here you'll see five numbers, or not five numbers, five buttons. And Typically, that would be, I would think, for every configuration that you have. So you have know, changing it from one to two, and it changes the configuration I have here based on the car I have. And But you notice the car is not changing up there either. And again, this is beta. I think this is going to get cleared up later on. But when I go to three or four or five, nothing happens. And I've got more configs than that, and I'll show you that when we get there. Right, so back to the device setup for the DD2. Maximum steering angle. Okay, a little button pops up and it tells us the maximum steering angle. Obviously, you guys probably are familiar with that. I'm going to go back over here to one. You can see I have it set to 900. Overall force back strength, force feedback strength rather. And again, that's pretty much self-explanatory how much force feedback the wheel is going to put out. So yeah, I have it on 80% right now. 
anywhere between 80 and 100% is usually where I'll be setting this depending on the car, the track, and the game that I'm in. Of course, that might change with different versions of this. Uh, vibration strength, I don't use any vibration in the wheel, or of course I don't have any pedals anyway, but I wouldn't use it there either. It's just something that, I, I just not for me. It's a, it's a cool thing, you know, if you're into it, but I just don't like it. Uh, pedal vibration, same thing. We're in the off position there. It's, it's kind of strange that we have off all the way to the left over here for the SHO, and then we have off all the way over here to the right for the, yeah, it's just it's kind of weird that, that it does that. But anyway. Uh, again, this will be in flux. I'm, I have stopped change, saying that because I want to say it every time I see something that I think should be changed or I would like to see changed. Game force effect strength. Now, this is the strength of, force, of the force feedback effects coming from the game. In default, they'll put that at 100%. And I usually put that at 100% too. And if it's too strong for me, I'll go up here and adjust in the overall force back strength. Or in game, I will actually adjust down from there to where it's comfortable. And you know, that's just uh, my process. Everybody has probably a little different uh, as far as the process goes, even though some people are gonna get this brand new and look at it and go, what is all this stuff? <laughs> spring effect, all right. Strength of the spring, spring effects coming from the game. Now, this is where I play a lot with the spring effects and the damper effects. And also down here in the friction, we'll talk about that in a minute. Because this is, it affects the feel of the wheel. The wheel can get pretty, dull and stiff if you have too much spring effect or, or dampening effect in it, even friction for that matter. These are the three guys that I'm typically playing with a lot to get a wheel dialed in, all right? Now I don't have, or rather friction down here, not the damper, uh, for natural damper, but these are, these are the main three suspects as I call them, right? First, once I have the effect pretty much dialed in where I want it, then I'll start to fine tune using spring and the dampener strength and friction if it's available in the menu, and it is here, but this is a constant friction that actual is for the podium series wheels, has nothing to do with the game. Right, so spring effect, again, is sometimes used in menu center spring, a realignment of the force while driving. So it kind of wants to return to center. That's what the spring effect does. And you can get it pretty strong, and it was just jerking it out of your hands, trying to come back to center. And of course you don't want that, but it's just something you have to play with, like everything here, to find out what you like, right? Now, it also says down here is a little message where it says, this is not a constant spring, it's only controlled by the game. and will not result in any effect other than what the game is putting out. Well, the thing is, there's no other string, uh, spring string <laughs> effect here anywhere as far as for just the wheel, right? It's, it's always been spring effect from the game, and that, that's the way Fnatic has always done their stuff. All right, let's move on down to the game dampener. And of course, that's what the game dampening is, is giving you above and beyond the dampening that you're putting on from just the wheel itself. And like I say, the wheels driver's dampening. So you can adjust that too, which is very good. You can actually adjust that here. And instead of, in fact, in the games, you know, pretty much in, in the games like iRacing, you don't have much adjustment for that. But it's nice that on the wheel here, we can come out here and do this. Natural dampener. Now here's something new. Uh, adjust a constant damper, which is not influenced by the game. So that means it's the DD or the Podium Series dampener in the, in the firmware. And it's, it's something you can play with here along with the other dampers. It's kind of like a balancing act between dampening here. Um, you might turn it all the way off to see what the effects are without it and then slowly bring it in to get the feeling you want or go to 100% and go the other way. Depends on how you want to approach it. Now, also, we have the natural friction, and that is also a, I like to say, just a driver friction. In other words, it's in the firmware. It's not in the game. And it's a constant friction effect, which is not influenced by anything in the game. And default, by default, this is off, right? But I've actually used some of it to, to play with things and see how it affects the, the driving and the feel and the, wheel, the wheels giving me. Last but not least, force feedback intensity. And again, Yes, they go obviously intense or smooth effects the game will be. And 100% is most sharp direct and can be very harsh, like a, a jackhammer in your hands, if you will. <laughs> but I like some, some intensity. And right now I'm sitting on 80. And with balancing that intensity with the friction and dampening, it, you know, it's kind of a dance here. And, and it's really, there's no one setting that's right or wrong. Well, there's, there are some that just completely will really be messed up. And you'll know that anyway when you're driving the wheel. 
But you know, if you see other people's configurations and they've been working with them, then chances are is it might be a good starting point for you to start playing with your own with your own settings. Right. Anything else we want to talk about here? Steering wheel, MPS, or multi-position switch. Right now it's on auto. So we can use the MPSs, the 12 position switches, if you will. And right now it's on auto, which I believe is encoder mode. Yeah, encoder mode. So I, I believe that's what it defaults to in auto because that's what I'm able to use them for in iRacing settings for going between black boxes or doing brake bias and that kind of thing. Right. But you can manually override that with encoder constant. In other words, when you turn it, it's constantly on like flipping a switch on or pulse. So it only does a pulse like most encoders do, just a, a pulse on and off, right? And yeah, so again, I usually leave that on auto and it works just fine. Dynamic force feedback, that's something new here. And I am using it. First I turned it off because I, I just said, what do I need that for? And really it's only about speed anyway. It's speed threshold effect range and strength. Now what this is, if you're going down the straight and you're getting oscillation in your wheel because of the settings you have, and you like the settings and the turns, you know, the curves, and it, it helps you control the car better, it, but it just it's just too much going down the straights, hitting those little bumps, it tends to oscillate. And usually at higher strengths is where this is occurring, like 100%, 90%, uh, and then you have a high strength in the game itself, you'll have those oscillations. This is an attempt to be able to dynamically attack that or, or take hold of that. And here we have a speed threshold and that's nothing more than adjusting what speed you want this dampening to come on at, right? So a lot of times you're at high speed on a straight and you don't want any dampening like under 100 kilometers. I think 100 kilometers an hour is pretty, a pretty good one to use. And I played around with this and I have some limited success with it so far to get rid of the oscillations I was having. I'd really had to turn it up um, in a higher range and you don't want to do that because yeah you don't want the range to be too much because that's the degrees of turn on the wheel you have where the effect is 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 happening like center to 48 degrees either way or 50 degrees wherever you have it set on. Dampener effect strength and this is what we can actually dial in and out for how much dampening strength you want at that speed and above right and then we have driving reverse and that means if you're backing up, <laughs> you have a damper effect strength, fade in intensity. Um, I'm not sure. I guess when you're driving in reverse, uh, usually I'm pretty going pretty slow when I'm driving in reverse. But this might be something that you want to enable if you you crash into a wall and your wheel's locked up and you're trying to back up and the wheel's shaking. Of course, you do have your emergency stop button too to use. But <laughs> yeah, this is something that I. I I just haven't really experimented with that much, to be honest. I don't see in my style of driving and how I do things. I just don't think I need it. But, you know, it's, everybody has what you know, a different need as far as their force feedback feel and when they're going to use it, when they're not going to use it. And at least we have a choice, right? All right, let's go to vibration, something I do not use. Um, I have it all turned off. And this is where you will tune that for the engine, uh, you know, initial vibrations, the engine, you can go up here and one, two, three, these are the settings for the different degrees. And then you have percentage rates of what you want as far as your initial vibration. Rev limiter, if you hit the rev limiter, it'll vibrate, the wheel will vibrate. Suspension travel, if you take hits in the, you know, we're talking a direct drive wheel here though. You don't need, you're gonna feel it in the direct drive motor. You don't need, uh, yeah, I, I would think vibrating in your wheel on up, up above and beyond that especially with these podium wheels are so powerful. But again, anything you want to do, you can. And then down the bottom, we also have the pedals and uh, pedal throttle when they're going to vibrate. Of course, you can see it's not supported here and not supported there. It is supported because of a V2 wheel, but not supported because obviously we don't have any pedals. Right, moving on. Let's keep this thing going. LEDs on your wheel. Here you can go in and this is the display. That's the first one, seven segment mode. If you turn that off, then you don't get the fuel limiter leaders and things like that on your display if you want them. You want to enable this, obviously. We at least want our gear. And, uh, you know, when are we going to change? That will actually, the pit limiting warning, that kind of thing. Yeah, you might as well just leave those on, I would think. Over here, we have the rev LED. And if you actually turn that up or down, it'll close and come over. And by default, it, it does its own. Let's see, if we click on this, you can actually change the colors. Isn't that cool? So if I want it to, instead of blue, I want purple or yellow, then I can do that, or red or what have you. 
I can actually change that for the pit lane and the pit limiter. Now RPM red uh, RPM percentage again. This is something we can change the colors on. If I click on that and hold the I'm holding the mouse button down, and then you go in and say, okay, I don't want red. I want this purple, and I choose purple. See, now it's purple. Pretty cool, huh? And here in LED one, two, and three, this is how we can go through the RPM settings, how sensitive it is, and you may have to adjust that per car. And you can see each time I go on one of these, the corresponding LED is going to flash on and off, see? Right, so I know which one that I'm tuning. So yeah, this is where you can come in and customize your, your RPMs. Flag LEDs, those are the ones on the sides. And yeah, here's where we can do the same thing. We can hold the button down and change colors. And yeah, right now we have pit lane and pit limiter, and that's all that's on here. We do have wheel spin and wheel lock, which actually works in the car, but I haven't seen it working on my flag yet. Maybe that's why it's kind of grayed out. But again, this will change as we go along. One more thing, probably a very important thing, obviously, is saving our configurations and tuning menu preview. It tells me where I'm at right now in my tuning menu, right? And if I want to look at that, but typically I'm over here looking at this, not that. So, but it does give me that information so I don't have to go back and forth, which is nice. Game telemetry settings, enable telemetry. Obviously, my pre my, we, our previews aren't available currently. Um, the wheelbase tells me what the wheelbase, steering wheel, and if the pedals were there, there's no pedals. But it does say Fanatic Analog Pedal, but I think that's just a default setting. And we can scroll down and see some other things here. LED preview, uh, what's going on with the LEDs, and just an informational panes over here. I, was, I, I guess this is what this is. Tells me where my dynamic settings are. So it gives me one place to go to see all my settings and what's going on, which is nice. And again, over here, we see the games that we can select. If we're going to be running in a set of course, I would select that game. And all my profiles for a set of courses will come up in this window. This is where we're going to do all our work saving our profiles. I mean, I've only been running iRacing, so you can see I have a, a few <laughs> profiles here. Now, all you, you can actually make any one of these profiles default, which is nice. And let's say I'm in GT100 right now. If I wanted to save this, I made a change, I would come over here and say save, right? Because if, if I don't save this, it won't be here when I come back if I shut this, uh, if I shut the fan, fanana, <laughs> get it all mixed up, fan lab down. <laughs> so if I hit save, it'll actually warn me, overwrite, so a file already exists. And I'll say, no, don't overwrite it, right? Unless I wanted to, then I would say, yeah. So I can go in and click any one of these and say, load and it would load it. Let's see, right now, what am I on? I'm on the 80, so I'm gonna say load a 79, 100, I wanna load that. So I just hit load, and you can see it starts flashing a little bit as it's loading, and then once it's loaded, it'll stop flashing. Very cool, actually. Now, really, you know, I'm, I'm really liking what they have going on here so far in this app. It's, it's very intuitive. And here we have the tuning menu, only select settings to be saved or loaded. So vibration, only select settings to save or loaded. This will always, and it says right here, this way you can select to only load or save a specific part of a preset without the rest. I usually don't save, do any vibrations, so I could actually just, you know, unclick that and it won't, it won't matter, right? So I don't have to worry about it. And I can hit save that and file already exists. So it didn't really save anything in my file, as you can see, because it says it already exists, like no changes were made, which is good. Right, now we also have, if you don't trust the game or if, you, if we run into a buffer problem here, we can't get enough configurations, or our golden configurations we never want to lose, then you can actually export them. And I've done that already, so you can see how this, this works. The file types you can see right there, the extension is .pws. And if I hit export, the folder pops up, and I've already made a folder in my documents called Fan Fanalab, right? So I double click on that, and you can see I already have one in here. And then I would actually, instead of uh, well, actually, before I got to this point, I, and I would hit save for whatever I have down here, obviously. I'm going to cancel this. Before I got here, I would actually say, okay, which one do I want to save? I want to save this one, the, the 100. Okay, I'll click on that. And down here is where we can edit the names of our profiles. And I would just go ahead and highlight all of that. And it will let me copy it with a click of the mouse or Control C. Then I hit export again, go back to my Fanalab folder. And I will just paste that in. I'm saving the 100 one now. Save, and there it is. Successfully exported, awesome. So this is where you're gonna do all your profile management. Very important place to be. 
you don't want to lose a good profile if you get one. And trust me on that one, because <laughs> it's, it's hard to get it dialed back in. Well, maybe not hard, but it's just a pain, especially when you know you already have one that you liked. <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's about it so far with this application. Uh, Fatalab. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot, actually. It's very intuitive. I like the way the tune in uh, menu has sliders and you can manually click on it and slide something if you want. Let me remember what this is, 50%. And some of them increment in 10%, like those right there, in 10%. And some of them, like up here in, in the overall force feedback strength, are down by one percentage points. So, yeah, that's that, I'm not sure why they do it that way, but anyway. And another thing is, if you want to turn it off quick, you can either grab it like this and just drag it all the way back. Or if you want to go all the way to 100%, you can go all the way to the top here, hold it down, and it'll come to you. <laughs> How about that? Cool. So it's easy to navigate in here as far as getting in and, and getting a, like a 1% is not difficult. See that? I can go 99. I can go 98. You know, I've been into in a lot of software. I don't know about you guys. When you try to drag just 1% and it jumps 3% in increments or something, it's, and it's real pain trying to get the exact percent that you're looking for or the number you're looking for. So yeah, hats off for the way they've done this. It's very easy to navigate and change your settings. But again, we're, you know, we've only got two here we can do so far in our settings, and it doesn't change up here. That's one thing I'm sure they're going to change. So that's the app. I just want to go over it quickly with you just to show you what's in store with the new Fan Fanalab application. And yeah, it's looking pretty good if you ask me. I, I think they've done a good job. I'm glad they, they waited a while before they released it. And I can see why, because this is probably obviously took a lot of work to get this thing up and running. So what we'll do next is, yeah, we'll just get in the car and then we'll play around with some of these settings and I'll try to describe to you what I'm feeling when I change one or the other. All right, so here we are in iRacing in the Ferrari 488 GT3. And just going to do a quick live tuning session just so you guys can see how this Fanalab beta is working. Now, this is version 1.08, so I'm not sure how well everything's going to work on it, but it should at least give us the tuning options that we normally have. Now, currently I have the wheel set at 80% in iRacing, which would be 19 Newton meters because I deducted 20% from the 100, which is 25 anyway, it, it, which comes out of 20, but I usually put it one Newton meter underneath that just for, just because I've been doing that for a long time. Right, and I have 55 Newton meters set in the actual force feedback maximum force slider. And I want to show you those settings and the settings we end up with at the, at the end of this session. Right, right now my fan lab is looking like sin or maximum strength ang uh, angle rather is uh, 900 degrees. Force feedback, overall force feedback strength is 80%. We have vibration and all the vibration is off. Uh, the FOR or the force effect strength and spring effect strength are both at 50%, but in iRacing that has no effect, so we don't worry about that anyway. Natural damper sitting at 7%, friction at 1%. Force effect intensity is 90, which I'm playing with that. I might come down a little bit on that. Again, we'll have to probably start this whole session with this. All this is subjective to personal taste. So if you don't like these settings, be happy to you know, just change them to what makes you happy. Right. And another thing is you don't have to run these wheels at 100% all the time, even though there is an overhead issue there for some cars and some tracks. And yeah, but right now I'm just doing 80% because I'm not trying to kill myself to getting a good setting out of this thing. So with the settings I have currently, and I don't have any dynamic features turned on, dynamic force feedback turned on in the Fanalab. So I like a wheel to, to be kind of lively, but not like a jackhammer jerking all around all the time real hard, even though it might look like that's what's happening here as I go over bumps. But yeah, I, I kind of like the force I have at this current setting. But there's a problem, and I wanted to show you guys this, of oscillations here. If I go down the straight, so I'm hitting the brake now to stop, but yeah, you can see that there's, there's an issue with some oscillations here, obviously. Now, what I really wanted to do here is go into the dynamic force feedback first and see if that can cure it. And I have it disabled currently. It's called dampening overlay. I'm gonna enable it. Now, this is speed sensitive speed threshold, dampening, damper effect range, and damper effect strength. So, 
speed threshold. I have that currently at 70 kilometers, so it should start to take effect because that's what it says. That's where the damp dampening overlay starts to take effect. So I got 70 kilometers. That should be good for straights. I have dampener effect range at 65 degrees on the wheel as far as when I turn the wheel, when it's going to act on it. But if I'm at straight, I, I don't think I should need it. Dampener effect strength is currently 10. I'm actually going to put that to 20 to see if that can help it out a little bit just to see how effective this is. And you know what? i tell you what. I'm not going to put it at 20. I'm going to go ahead and put it at 100, see if we can just stop it. Because <laughs> if we can't do it at 100, then obviously it's not going to do it any less than that. So let's go ahead and test that out. So we got to get on any straight. And we have one coming up. Once we get around this curve here. All right. Yeah, the, this wheel feels a bit lively. I might be putting some friction in on this to cure that. All right, so here we are going down the straight. Nope, you can see, yeah. So it looks like our dynamic overlay or the, <laughs> it's, it's not working. Damper strength is always at 100 degrees. So, and I was well, a lot less than 65%. I was straight up and down when it, when it actually started. So it doesn't look like that's really having an effect. And I just want to test that. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off now because we know it's not doing anything. So now I'm going to go in and put some friction in. I'm going to actually put some dampening in first. I'm going to go about 15% dampening. And let me do 5% friction and see what that, how that ends up. All right. Here we go. Now, already I can feel a little bit of difference here. Just by a little bit of friction and dampening in it. Still, I think it's going to oscillate. Go down the straight. Here it goes. All right. So we're still having the oscillations. Now, you could actually play with the force effect intensity. And I'm actually going to bring that down first because I don't want to put too much friction in. I'm going to bring this down because the way it's doing, it's shaking so much. I'm going to go up to 60 and see how that works. See if that, well, that just went back to 70. There we go. And see if that has any effect at all because less of that is less intensity from the force feedback coming from the game. And yeah, that I was thinking that should probably dampen it out, but right away it looks like it's not. <laughs> Whoa. Saved it. <laughs> so we can definitely tell when it's sliding and we're able to slide, uh, save slides. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, this is just going down the straight though. I'm going to see. Yeah, there it goes. And of course, it's going to do it for sure going down the front straight in front of the pits because that's a very bumpy road. But I'm just going to try that one more time. Yeah. So we're not, that's not helping us much. So I'm going to go ahead and push that back up to 90. And I'm just going to have to turn some dampening and friction in, it looks like. I'm going to go up on the damper to 20, let's go 30 percent. All right, and my friction is currently at six. I'm going to bring that up to 10. I'm going to make it 15 because I think I need some. <laughs> All right, so let's see what that does going down the bumpy straight. Yeah, already I feel a difference. Well, There we go. <laughs> All right, so that wasn't a good test, was it? So let's get down here to the next straight. Yeah, it's, it's a bit, the friction is a bit much, I think. I'm gonna have to play with that a little bit. But yeah, let's see if we can get that oscillation to stop. And again, if I'm driving, I always have my hands on the wheel. It's a little bit of oscillation doesn't really bother me. Okay, there we go. 
No. All right, so that was enough to keep it from oscillating. Question is, can I go down? I'm going to go ahead and round out my dampening. I'm going to bring my dampening back down to 25%. I try to keep that down, and I'm going down to 10% on the friction. And let's see what we got now. It feels a little more lively there. I felt like I had too much dampening in it. It was just feeling just a bit sluggish. You know, it's, and it's this fine line between all this stuff. Yeah. Even when it locked up, you saw the wheel twitch, but it didn't oscillate. I think this is close to where we're going we're gonna to want to be here. And I'm feeling much better now that I turned that dampening down and the friction down a little bit. Still enough, I can feel the wheels pretty good here going over the bumps. You can feel them translate pretty well to the steering wheel. Rumble strips, things like that. Might even turn that friction down a little bit more. Going over some more bumps here. Yeah, I like the kind of like the way that feels. There's almost a little bit. I don't know. That, the rumble strips feel great. It almost feels like there's a, a almost like a, a friction when we turn it. Like I can actually feel it. Instead of smooth friction, it's a not. A, I don't want to say notchy, but there's a grain to it. Yeah, that's a better way to say it. Grain. So what I'm going to do is come back down on the damping, and I'm going to come down on the friction. Oops, don't want to run over any cones. I'm coming. To, I'm going to leave friction about six. See what happens. All right. I think we're getting close here. And again, it's a shame the dynamic doesn't work. But yeah, here's what it is. <laughs> and it is beta, so I'm sure eventually it's going to end up better. And I'm sure I'm going to oscillate now. Yep. Okay. But again, only if I let go of the wheel. <laughs> if I have a hand on it to steady it, kind of a, a damper effect on it, then it's okay. I tell you, I do not like this this effect of tensity at 90%. It's just, it's too much. There's too much, it's throwing like too much detail out or something. I'm backing down that down to 70. And again, all subjective. It just, yeah, this feels better already, I can tell. Yeah. You can still feel all the detail. Let me go over some bumps here. Yeah. But it doesn't have that. You see how it, it snapped back? So it's got plenty of power. But it doesn't have that. that When you have too much of the intensity on, it's like it's, it's almost like a little jackhammer, like too much notchiness around on it. Or some, you know. And this is iRacing, obviously. Other games, it'll be different. So I kind of like this, I think. Yeah. You can feel the bumps going over the concrete sections pretty good. Yeah, and the transition when you go back onto the asphalt. That's what's so great about Sebring and iRacing, this laser scan track. Every trans... When you, when you go from one section of it to the next, a different surface like concrete to asphalt, all that is in there. You can feel it. And, of course, you can feel the rumble strips really good, too. Not all of them, though. It's kind of weird. Like, right there, it's not very pronounced, but there's another one up here that really is. Like that one is. If I go run around this one, it's more pronounced than the one back there. Not sure if that's by the design or not. All right. So I think I'm pretty happy now with what we got. And these rumbles feel real good. Especially when you're going sideways on them, you have the car loaded up. And putting a lot of weight on one on the left side of the car there, you can really feel it pretty well. Now we're just going down the straight. I will get the oscillations probably. Yeah, see how when I hit the brakes? I did them. But I would never do that again. I keep saying that. But some people want it so it doesn't do that. It doesn't have the force to do that. But I like to have some force in there. It just tells me more what the car is doing. Now going down the straight, it certainly will. See how it jumped right there? because there's a lot of pumps and you can feel them all in the steering wheel. So 
yeah, uh, overall, the what I'm getting back from this DD2 wheel is, is very good. I uh, really, it's, it's pretty well mannered. I might, let me just up the friction just a hair. I don't want to put too much dampening on it. I'm going to go back up to 10% on the friction. And I think that might be exactly what I want. All right, so, yeah, that's feeling better already. It doesn't feel that, I don't have as much grain in it. So that's what friction will do for you. Get some of that notchy grain around the center of the wheel when you're going back and forth. All right, so here we are. I think we are good to go now, guys. And again, at the end of the session here, I will load my settings in. Yeah, that feels good. Go up on this curve. You can feel that one pretty good. This one, you go up on it. Yeah, it's got, when you come back off of it, it should, the wheel should snap back this way, and it did. Yeah, that feels pretty natural. Yep. And everything is immediate, too. So everything is, as you see it, it's happening. Like I said, this outrunner motor is doing a good job, actually. I wasn't sure how to what it was going to feel like. Plenty of power, that's for sure. Plenty of power. I don't think anybody... Most people aren't going to want for any more power than what this, this thing's putting out. Yeah. I mean, it just... When you have higher power, though, it's easier to feel the slide to me when it starts happening. See that, how it was sliding back and forth? And I could naturally control it just from what I was feeling in the wheel. The, as you know, my, my, my chassis is not moving, my cockpit. And I, it, normally it is when I'm regularly driving. So, yeah, and good bumps down the straight here. Let's see what we do around the corner. Yeah. Okay, I kind of like this. And we're going to get a lot of bumps going down the straight here. You can feel every bump. <laughs> Yeah, this is good. You can just feel it when it starts to, to lose the grip. It gets light up on the wheel. And you know when you've turned too far. This is doing a good job now. Let's drop it off here. Yeah, that's good. Yep, you felt the little transition there. All right. So I think that's about it, guys. I think I'm going to let it rest here. I think this is a setting that I'm happy with for the Ferrari 488, of course, and at Sebring. And that's going to vary a little bit between tracks and cars and we change it. But I find that when I get a basic configuration that I like the way it feels, I'm not having to tweak it too much between tracks and cars to get that feel back. Some, yeah, but mainly, it, mainly it's like the intensity I'm having to tweak more than the the dampening and the friction. So yeah, I'm usually on the intensity slider or the force slider to correct for like a, a bumpier suspension, you're gonna wanna turn it down, the, the force effects, because it's just, it'll just jerk you around like crazy. So, but then again, in a Mazda Miata, I'd probably be turning it up. And also, it also matters what kind of wheel you're running. I'm running a 270, very light millimeter wheel that's very, very light, as you guys know, and it tends to be twitchy on its own anyway. If I had a 320 uh, OMP on here or a 300, had my turn racing wheel on here or an, or an Asher 285, then I would compensate for the, the heavier weight they have. And if I was using the quick release on those, obviously that's more weight on the wheel too. All that matters. So it's a constant little, little tuning dance in between when you switch wheels, you switch cars and tracks. But I'm kind of happy with this. I might even tweak it a little bit more, I'm not sure. I might throw, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here, but I'm going to let you guys see what the final settings are here that I ended up with. And now we'll just get in and do some driving and eye racing. I'm going to do some driving in a set of Corsa also. I'm not sure if I'm going to do something else, but yeah, just give you some, my, my thoughts while I'm driving, like I normally do in the driving section. So here we are in eye racing at Sebring, my favorite testing track, of course. 
and I wanted to test at the same track, but throw a couple of different cars at it to see, except for, I do go to the ring and run too. That's what, my second favorite track for testing stuff. And yeah, I wanted to go from a tight suspension to a looser suspension. So I got in the Lotus 79. And if you guys have ever driven that, you know, it's a very tightly sprung car. The suspension is really bumpy in it. And it's a good example, I think, to find out what a direct drive wheel is capable of delivering and not only power, but also oh, while it's delivering the power, the, the little details that you, you need to feel. And yeah, it, it passed here. The DD2 did a, a fabulous job once I got a setting that, uh, that I liked in it. And again, this is a 285 millimeter steering wheel. So I'm not going to be running as, as much power on this wheel as I am because of the leverage difference on a bigger wheel than the smaller wheel like this. I'm over here in the Commodore, and that's the bigger wheel example I was talking about. You get much more leverage on the wheel when it's bigger like this. So I usually change the force that I'm getting out of the wheel per, when I'm switching from different steering wheels that have bigger diameters on them. Anyway, the whole thing here is being on the Sebring track, I'm able to go from a tight suspension, and this is a V8 Supercar Commodore, to a softer suspension. And see what the differences are and see if I'm able to tune this wheelbase to match the needs of these different cars. And yeah, so far it's, it's passed with flying colors. I really don't have anything bad to say about the behavior of this wheel. This is a very slippery car, as you can see me twitching the steering wheel there a lot. So I was able to dial in a good enough force feedback feeling that allowed me to control this car and feel when it was getting loose and correct for that, as you can see when I was doing before, when I was jerking the wheel around a bit there because you can feel it right away. So yeah, this, this motor is doing a good job. I was wondering about an outrunner motor and how it would behave in the direct drive force feedback role. And yes, it was doing a great job. And, and it continues to do a job. Over here, I'm in the Ferrari 488 GT3 at the ring. And same thing, back to the Asher wheel this time. And different track though, not as, not as bumpy. It can be very bumpy in certain sections, but I think there's a lot, there's a lot of smoother sections in the ring compared to like Sebring. But yeah, again here, it just is passing the test that, that I'm giving it. it. I was able to adjust it to the Ferrari, going from the V8 supercar to the Ferrari, and just a few tweaks on the, the force effects. I think force effects are, is one of the things that I, I tweak a lot, believe it or not, uh, going from car to car because of the different suspensions and, the, and if the bumpy track versus a smooth track, because of the amount of force it, it puts out, the effects it puts out, and, and then obviously I'm going into dampening and friction and, and playing around a little bit in there. And it was easy enough. And I, I like this new Fanalab tuning software. It does a great job. It, you know, it's, it's nice to have that. All the other direct drive wheels that I've ever run have that. And now that, that Fanatic has, Fanatilab, yeah, it's going to be a, a great marriage, I think, between the software and the wheel. Even though you could do the settings in the wheel itself. It's a much more powerful interface than just being able to do it in your wheel. So here we are on a set of courses. Notoriously not my favorite game to run in because it has good force feedback in places like the rumble strips and going off track and things like that. It gets loose good, but it just has this, this, this vagueish feeling to me. It's hard to describe on the actual racetrack surface. It doesn't have the details like if, if I was running this at a, at a bumpier track, it just doesn't transmit the details as crisply as, say, iRacing does. But it has good rumble strips, and, and like I said, the other effects are fine. And, and when you slide, you can feel it pretty much right away. But again, because of the vague feeling of, of the, the road surface against the tire that I feel here, it's, yeah, and when you get off like that, you can feel all of that. But when you get back on the, on this, on the track itself, it just, just feels vague to me a bit. But not to where I couldn't tune this DD2 to where it did a good job and allowed me to handle the car quite well without sliding around. I was able to catch slides. And really, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, being able to tune your steering wheel that you're using to race with so that you can control the car. And secondary is to give you that immersive feeling that you're in the actual car. And a powerful motor like this that can max out the 25 newton meters is more than capable of allowing you to do that. And yeah, I'm sitting here waiting for the guys to come back by because I, I wanted to, to fight with them again. <laughs> I was having some fun, obviously. So overall, yeah, I, I really can't complain. I can't any, find any bad habits this motor has. And I, and I, and I do like that Fanalab software. It really is, 
I'm, I'm glad I'm not having to tune this through the menu on the wheel. It's much more intuitive to use sliders up there on the fourth monitor that I have. And, and I was able to dial in a good feeling force feedback result much quicker, I think. And yeah, and of course, this is, this is new days for, for Fanatic in the direct drive world. Uh, everybody else, every other direct drive system out there, even though there's one with some new motors, has been out for a while. And they've had a long time to be able to tweak their firmware and you know, t also the software programs that, that are running now with the, with the newer stuff. Yeah, I think this is just new days, and I think it's going to get just better and better for Fnatic here as they further develop the firmware and the software, the Fanalab, because I'm running beta here, a beta 1.08, I think it was, or 8.0 or something like that. 08, I think that was. Anyway, it might not be the same uh, firmware, or rather application. Oh, we're getting a little rough there. <laughs> we're getting a little rough, man. a little bump from the back. Uh, anyway... I'm sure that everything will, will continue to progress with the firmware and this this very good tuning software. I like what I have so far out of it. Even though there's some things that don't work on it, as we saw, the the dampening, the dynamic dampening, didn't have much of an effect on our oscillations on the steering wheel. But again, like I said, it's early days for that stuff. I'm just super happy to see Fnatic come out with this because I think it was it was it's long overdue for their wheels, and they're all their wheels in general, actually. I'm not sure how compatible is it going to be for the belt-driven wheels, but we'll just have to wait and see how that matures. Right, so that's about it. Uh, again, I, I really don't have any quibbles about this wheel base itself and the, the way it delivers the power and the, the fidelity of the force feedback effects. Um, I feel like we could get more fidelity out of it if we had a solid uh, mount system for the wheels, but, of course, you know, I've already been through that on the closer look and the look inside stuff that, yeah, you know, you, you got to have backwards compatibility for the, the, the thousands and thousands of wheels that they've sold over the years. And you can't just put, leave people out in the cold and put a solid mount on there. But it sure would be nice to have an option for that, Fanatic. <laughs> All right, so that's it for this. Now what we'll do is we'll just get over to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the Fanatic Podium DD2 wheelbase. The overall build quality of the DD2 is typical Fanatic style. It presents itself as a very polished piece of sim racing hardware with features that some other wheelbases don't have. And the main one that sticks out to me is the front OLED panel display. Here the user can get live real-time information on the status of certain wheel functions like motor data, temp info, and fan speed, system info, and my personal favorite, force feedback torque output in real time. Very handy indeed. With cooling air drawn in from the front of the motor case and expelled out the back, I never even heard the fan running. With a peak torque rating of 25 newton meters, this unit requires a large power supply to keep it happy. And I do like that the power supply that they provide has its own fan for cooling duties. The e-stop button is a nice add for the wheelbase, being able to turn the wheelbase on and off with its included power button feature is a welcome addition. But I did find it interesting that the e-stop button actually powers down the motor instead of disabling the motor's torque like most other direct drive motor solutions out there. I like how solid the wheelbase quick release assembly felt here. I did have to tighten the M6 bolts on the locking collar on my sample to eliminate the wheel losing its center point when driving. Something you really shouldn't have to do on a new wheelbase, but you know, it was easy enough to fix. Now, because this assembly is so stiff on the wheel side or the wheel base side, it did cause attention to be drawn to the not new issue of flex in the wheel side quick release that is used on most all Fanatic wheels, Universal Hub, and the upcoming Podium Hub. Even with the expanding rubber ring cinched down as tight as I could get it and using the fixing bolt, there was still some visible flex in that area. You know, I would love to see Fanatic come out with an adapter that would connect directly to the DD2's motor shaft like the current wheelbase side quick release unit does with a 70 millimeter PCD bolt pattern and a plate that would allow users to attach their own quick release solution. This would allow us to squeeze that last bit of force feedback fidelity that the DD2 has to offer. Speaking of which, the driving experience with the DD2 is quite good I had all the power <laughs> that most any sim racer would ever want, I think, with overall driving experience to be just as good as the other 
newer direct drive solutions I've tried to date. And now we have the new Fanalab tuning software to make dialing in your preferred force feedback feeling a rather easy thing to do. I was able to get my DD2 set up where I really didn't want any more adjustments that were not already available using the Fanalab. Of course, not every feature is available on the one, was it 1.08 beta version that I was using. But this is early days for Fanalab and I'm sure it will be tweaked a lot as it matures. Just like other direct drive wheel tuning software that's available from under other vendors has matured. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this application improves moving forward. Overall, I really like the DD2 wheelbase. I couldn't find anything to complain about when it comes to driving with it. No obvious bad habits were detected. I wasn't sure how a direct drive motor using an outrunner design would function in this role, but I'm happy to say it does this job quite well. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.